Good evening, friends, everybody joining us online. Very, very happy to welcome you to this evening's program hosted by the India International Center and by Penguin Books. I will introduce our two conversationalists for the evening, Ashish Nandi and Amit Chaudhary. I'm dispensing with honorifics at their behest, at both their behest. I'm Ananya Vajpayee. And both of them are so well known and so multifaceted that um, I will not, for purposes of our program this evening, um, tell you about their various accomplishments, designations, achievements, awards, and publications. Um, rather, I will try to introduce them in a way that makes most sense for what we will be talking about this evening, which is music, and in particular, Hindustani music, the khayal. Ashishda has written on practically every aspect of Indian culture, society, life, and politics. What many people don't know, because he hasn't written much about it, is that he has had a lifelong, very passionate, very knowledgeable, and deep engagement with Hindustani classical music. This is something that he has pursued um, with interest, with passion for decades. And although he doesn't write as a music critic and he doesn't uh, himself practice any kind of music, he nonetheless uh, knows more about it than you or I. Um, and he's also particularly um, uh, uh, personally, uh, he knows the music of Amit Chaudhary, and that is why um, he'll be the one to be talking uh, to Amit Chaudhary this evening. Amit Chaudhary, again, like Ashishda, is a man who wears many hats. He's a writer of both fiction and criticism. He writes essays, he writes novels. Um, he is also uh, an active and performing musician uh, in many different kinds of music, both Indian and Western. Um, and he uh, is also a teacher and a professor of literature of creative writing. In addition, he has in recent years been a very active and engaged citizen of Calcutta, uh, where he lives. Um, uh, involved in projects to do with urban conservation, uh, urban fabric, as well as what he calls literary activism. What we are going to be talking about this evening is Amit's latest book, uh, Finding the Raga, um, published by Penguin, an improvisation in Indian music. Now, I myself have uh, known, talked to, conversed with, um, listened to, read, um, admired, and learned from both Ashish Nandi and Amit Chaudhary my entire adult life. Um, and so I can tell you that this book, like every book of Amit Chaudhary's thus far, is something that um, really defies our expectations of genre. Um, it is uh, equally um, a memoir about growing up and growing into a certain kind of music. It is a set of notes by a musician and uh, somebody who has formally studied and understood both the history of music as well as the practice of different kinds of music. And it is um, a book that equally can speak to specialists, to people who are formally trained in the languages of different kinds of music. So this is indeed a very, it's a small book, but it's very, very special and rich. Um, and I would like to start by inviting Ashishda to enter into this book uh, on behalf of the entire audience. Um, 
on a subject that Ashish Da himself has spent his life studying, which is the very nature of creativity, the creative imagination, and the creative mind, the creative personality, um, something that Amit Chaudhary surely exemplifies. So Ashish Da, over to you. Thank you, Ananna. <clears throat> um, Amit, it's lovely to see you here. And it was a pleasure reading your book, though my reading is heavily restricted these days because my delayed eye operation. And so I will start by asking you a simple question about the issue you raise by beginning the book with a conversation with Kishori Amunka. He suggests in that conversation that music provides or promises bliss. Now, bliss has many meanings in everyday life and in certain philosophical contexts. Usually, bliss doesn't mean happiness. But there is an effort nowadays to complete the two terms. There are schools and universities where they give courses on happiness. It is supposed to be a very good medicine against consumerism and uh, getting too mired in virtual in the virtual world. Where do you stand? Do you agree with Kishori that bliss is one of the things? Now, Kishori, of course, is talking of a different kind of bliss, the kind which both Buddhist literature, philosophy as well as Hindu tradition uh, uh, as a place for. That's a different kind of bliss. It is not happiness. It's bliss can be can hardly be reconciled with happiness factories that, that have grown up thanks to the numerous gurus who navigate the world these days. Let you stand. OK. Thank you, uh, Ashishda, and thank you for being part of this conversation that means a lot to me. Um, so I am um, I'm just quickly looking back at the, the interview with Kishwari Amonkar that you mentioned, which was which I used as a as an epigraph to the book. Uh, the, so the, the, the thing that you're referring to. Um, so the question was, uh, can't art be born from happiness? Uh, and, and then Kishwari Amonkar goes to you know, uh, think about what what the the, the interviewer means, and uh, the interviewer reminds her that you said pain and suffering lead to the highest art, uh, and 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 then from there she goes on to talk about uh, joy or bliss uh, by using the word an anand or anand, anand. So uh, I am very interested in this word uh, anand, and I also have a chapter. In the book called Ananda, which, uh, uh, in the sense of um, having uh, uh, splitting the word into a h a and nanda, ananda punning on the word, because I wanted to draw attention uh, to a particular form of vocalizing in uh, Hindustani classical music, which is called akar. Um, the the, the alap. And even the tans uh, are often done in the with the ah sound. Yeah, it can be done on uh, with words, but the, the 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 foundational kind of practice of the music is done with vocal music is done with the ah sound. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, there is also a a, a kind of uh, estuel of uh, uh, vibrato. Or, or tremolo, which you hear in, especially in post-romantic or romantic Western music in opera, the the the, the vibration, vibrating of the voice, uh, 
to add emotion that the, the, the to create uh, to create a kind of tremulousness the word is either tremolo uh, tremolo or vibrato in in western music akar uh, sort of rejects vibrato it 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 it, it kind of wants to move uh, through the meers which are gliding notes between which are which are glides between one note and another uh, in a in a in a in a in quite a serene way uh, through the akar now kishori amulkar herself did this so i'll come to anando in a ananda in a second bliss in a second but you know the first time i heard uh, one of the first times i heard kishori amulkar uh was as i say in the book uh on the morning pro program um Prati pratibha ani pratima um a, a marathi language program that used to be shown on television uh on sundays in in bombay and she was being interviewed and 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 she sang uh, a few lines from from a, uh, from a khayal uh and and the lines uh, were characterized by her wonderful jaipur gaiki meers but meers which are very individual to herself as well and she uh, mainly sang them on on the a ah syllable i was very struck by the purity of the tone and and uh, what was happening to the to the way she was uh, giving us the rag um for me the, uh, the the use of a ah and the kind of rejection of vibrato is uh, are very important kind kind of decisions in hindustani classical music uh, to reject uh, emotion additional emotion in the conventional sense which uh, western music uh, after the romantic period especially emphasizes uh, emotion through vibrato <laughs> you know that kind of thing uh, while in hindustani classical music that 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 kind of vibration isn't there um so when we are talking about anando we are then not talking about happiness in a, 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 a we are not talking about happiness we are also not talking about joy in a conventional sense we are talking about a kind of serenity uh, that accompanies this music that accompanies the akar uh, where the akar and the note almost replaces the sense of self with which we identify emotion the sense of self is the seat of emotion uh, uh, then akar and the note is something that replaces the self uh the, the the moment of classical music the moment of khayal the moment of singing is the replacing of the self with the purity of the note and the rag it is not an expression of the self it is a, it is the self giving way to the primacy of the note and the rag uh i think this is what she means by by anand anand uh, this this the uh, self being replaced by the note it is it is uh, it is not easy to do it is uh, extremely difficult to find this particular form of anand uh because there are so many impediments uh that come between the creative person's wish to to lose themselves in the note I mean, she, uh, Ashish, that she herself used to during performance always be on edge towards, especially towards the beginning of performances. And one of the reasons was, I mean, she, I, I read in an interview somewhere which where she said that I don't like the spotlight on my face because it comes between me and the rag. She also used to tell the audience, I was in an, such an audience myself when I was seventeen, sixteen, or seventeen years old at Rang Bhavan, Bombay. When she told the audience. uh if any of you want to leave uh, please do so now but don't do that after i begin to sing 
And, and the reason for this, which then sounded to many of us like an arrogant statement, I, I see now was her, um, her deep dedication to, to this project of immersing herself in, in the note, in the rag, where you know somebody getting up and leaving or the spotlight on her face would come between that and herself. So by Anundo, I think she means this, this, this kind of embrace of something which replaces the self, in this case, music. It does not mean uh, happiness or positive emotion in a conventional sense. Uh, but but I would like to point out the other connotation of Anandar, which I think pervades not only Kishori's music, but also a number of other disciplines, where Ananda is almost like an additional Purushartha. Bliss is something which is unattainable, almost unattainable, but you can sometimes touch it, touch it as yet something which has come and perhaps gone also. So in that particular sense, it has a philosophical status too. And I have a belief, uh, I have the belief that perhaps music is one of the disciplines through which you can attain that kind of a bliss. I include music amongst uh, four or five modes of self which invoke bliss. Poetry is another. Deprofessionalized philosophy can, can be a third one. And perhaps even uh, art and painting and sculpture can also bring you in touch with that concept of bliss. bliss which cannot be reproduced in the happiness factory, which we see all around us. So there is this part of the story, and it is one of the most fundamental concepts in Buddhism and also to some extent in Vedan. You can also see, and in to Vedan, you see touches of that kind of thing. And my feeling is this, that this, the disciplines I have named, mathematics is another, are disciplines where at a point, this comes when, if I can put it in my language, the bliss comes when, or you touch bliss when, the music you are creating takes control of itself. The singer feels as if, as if he or she, she he, he is being sung through. Previously, great sculptors like Michelangelo would call it divine gift. Now that expression has gone out of fashion. But nonetheless, it is a, it, there comes a moment when you don't think you are controlling the music, the music is controlling you. It, is, it has acquired a certain autonomy. It is speaking through you. You are an instrument. And it is that part of bliss which I think pervades not only music, but great art of many, many kinds. Also, perhaps, the professional philosophy and mathematics. Because these are disciplines, in some sense, they are primal disciplines, primordial. It touches something deep within us, and they, they acquire their autonomy when the musician has, in some sense, lost his self. That comes in your in your explanation of this too. I, that's the meeting point of um, the philosophical concept of bliss and the musical concept of bliss. I guess. How do you react to this? I want. I want to react. I want to respond to what, one particular thing you said, uh, Ashista, when you were speaking right now and uh, and and that is uh, the idea that this is something that we can touch uh, 
for a while. I mean, uh, it is it is not something we can possess. Um, and and you mentioned uh, the Buddhist idea uh, from where you know um, the Tagore family and and including the poet Rabindranath Tagore uh, derives his, uh, his 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 transformative interest in the notion of Anandu. Um, I want to, I want to uh, uh, just respond over here. And here, we are, um, one is going to digress from the discussion of music into a discussion of uh, of creativity. Since you mentioned poetry, uh, I want to touch upon that. I want to touch upon poetry. Um, I want to contrast poetry with with narrative and history. Um, and and. Uh, so if, if narrative is a way of possessing what it represents, that is, if, if narrative, let us say, in, in a work of fiction, we usually think that a work of fiction should fully represent what uh, it's, it's kind of narrating, right? Uh, uh, and, and we have a lower tolerance for incompleteness in fiction and in narrative than we do in poetry, where we expect incompleteness to be a feature of poetry, uh, that is, uh, not full possession. Letting go is a feature of the poetic. In 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 narrative fiction, we want possession. We want that person. Uh, that is the way we see it. If you don't write narrative fiction of that kind, then you're in trouble. Like I have often been in trouble trouble for not fully possessing what I represent. But that is a that is a kind of decision I took uh, not to uh, because I, I I was not interested in that. Uh, the same goes for uh, other forms of narrative, such as history, uh, and uh, and the convergence of history and narrative in a form such as uh, the historical novel, which has which has had a resurgence in especially in India in the last uh, uh, fifteen uh, years or so. Uh, these are forms of documenting and possessing. Compare that to the late nineteenth-century experiments in poetry by uh, Rabindranath, by by Tagore. Uh, poetic experiments to do with history, uh, uh, and specifically Ujjain and specifically Kalidash. So uh, there, there are at least two poems. One is called Shopno or Dream. And uh, the other is called Meghdut, which are about revisiting history, but poetically, which means one is aware that one is touching history only transiently and for a while. It is only in that transient uh, encounter with history that history is experienced most powerfully and one might say most blissfully. So in in Shopno, in Shopno, the the the, the speaker. So by the way, we already have we already have. Tagore's essay on Kalidas, a couple of essays, but one certainly in mind, where he says, we are forever severed from that uh, world of Ujjain, the Mandrakanta meter. That, that world is gone. A, a great gulf separates us from that world. These two poems are about uh, visiting that world, the means of visiting that world very temporarily through a kind of spell of enchantment, one might say, which is also an, a kind of bliss. So in Shopno, um, he, uh, the speaker is wandering through lanes and suddenly finds he is in Ujjain. And then when he finds he's in Ujjain, he immediately realizes that if I go beyond this temple, where the worship has stopped now, I can recognize the path. And I, if I go a little further, I'm going to go to the lane where the, a beloved from my past life used to live. So he goes into that lane. And then as he stands there, he recognizes the house. And then he sees his beloved from a past life come down the stairs. And this beloved uh, recognizes him too. And they stand facing each other. But then the speaker says, but we had forgotten the language in which we spoke to each other. So we only held each other's hands 
and tears stream down our face. And that is the end of the poem. Uh, this is one poem in which he rejects the idea of going to Ujjain and narrating what Ujjain was and possessing it completely. In, in uh, uh, Meghdut, which is about reading uh, Kalidas's Meghdut, the, the, the long poem, he talks about his mind floating over Meghdut, looking as, sorry, over Ujjain, looking at, at all the details of the ancient city, which is contemporary and alive in the poem. And then he says, by the end of the poem, that outside it is raining. He suddenly, the poem ends, he finishes reading the poem so that his poem is a record of what is happening to him while he's reading Kalidas's poem, what, what is happening to his imagination. Then he says, then the spell ends. The spell ends and I'm back in my room and it is raining outside. Uh, this is uh, another example of a poetic conception of a blissful encounter with history. The, the bliss is contained in the fact that it cannot be history cannot be possessed. It has to be let go for it to be uh, most powerfully felt, most powerfully experienced. In both these cases, history is experienced most vividly, most powerfully, most joyously because it is not possessed, because the person who's encountering it is only there for a little while in contact with history. This goes completely against the social science idea or the idea of the historical novel that history can only be understood by possessing it, by recreating it, by understanding it, and understanding it through the archive and that, that by mastering it. So one might say that this too is a kind of joy that we are talking about over here. Um, <clears throat> I just intervene for a second, uh, first of all, to request viewers to please type in their questions uh, in the in the box that has been provided for that purpose. Um, and uh, Amit Babu, it's amazing that you're, uh, you know, talking about these two poems. Uh, uh, you know, I, I myself spent some time reading you on them and then writing about them. Um, but I think this ties in very nicely with um, with an argument that you make in the book. Not an argument, I shouldn't say that. That sounds too social science -y, as you were saying. Um, but uh, a claim that you make that uh, one of the ways to differentiate between Western classical music, say Beethoven, and the Indian raga, right, is uh, by looking at what you call um, the question of representational fidelity. Right? And the question of narrative. That in Western music, there is a strong association between the, the course that the music takes and the story that is being sought to be told, as well as the human experiences, human emotions, etc., that are in a way mimetically being expressed through the music. But the raga form is not like that. It neither has any kind of necessary narrative expectation and as you say it there's an it, abjuring of portrayal in the raga right and in in that sense if western music is more like fiction indian music is more like modern poetry right um in that it is expressive but it's not necessarily mimetic of human experience and this is something that i think you develop in a genuinely brilliant way in the book, um, could you could you could you talk about it a little bit for for the audience? And particularly, I I, I also wanted to ask you, um, you know, you in in this context, you bring in uh, the question of the time of day and the season of year when ragas are supposed to be sung, and with which they have a conventional but an unbreakable sort of association. Now, in certain schools of painting, you see the Ragamala paintings. There is actually an attempt to visually create um, 
an image of the raga itself. And again, through very specific symbols, particular animals, particular kind of women, particular times of day, particular seasons, and natural settings, and so on. So in, in what is happening in that kind of painting, do you think there is an attempt to break through this barrier uh, you know, between the mimetic and the non-mimetic, uh, and in a sense, figure the raga into a new kind of narrative fabric? Both uh, very good questions. I, I um, Before I take them, let me also ask Ashishta whether he wants to add anything, say anything, and then I'll take Ananya's questions. And if Ashishta has anything to add, I can respond to that too. Uh, I wanted to tell you that when you talk of history, that history possessed and history need not be possessed. Hmm? That basically history as it has evolved as a discipline can only talk of possession. It has no capacity to yield to human imagination because you cannot invoke the past. You can bring in persons, but you cannot invoke personality because there are strict rules of historiography. The history is supposed to be empirically sustainable, empirically supportable. So history has a limitation as a construction of the past because you have no capacity to imagine the past in a way that you can host it within you without possessing it. No. One of the major signs of creativity I have found in the persons I have worked with that there is a capacity to host the otherness of others. And this otherness of historical others cannot be hosted when you deny them their emotional, motivational, and inner life, so to speak. You have to imagine it out. So in some sense, Kalidasas or Tegos, uh, Tegos po uh, poem on Meghdut, or Kalidasas Meghdut itself, is a different kind of history. It, it, it is not history. It is it's a is it, it, available to you here and now as a part of the present. And I am reminded of this lovely book, which I recommend that it's quality while uh, going through your book. Uh, um, Gananath Obesekere's book, The Abacand Months, where he brings in the concept of Freud's dream ego to explain the phenomenology of visionary statements. Because this is what we are required in this context, how to handle visionary experiences. And if you love this story about uh, Blake, that this was a, uh, there was a, this professor who was interviewing him. And he says, yes, uh, Socrates said this. In response to a question, Blake said, Socrates said that. Now, this man was very learned. He said, I don't think Socrates ever said that. So Blake says, no, but he told me. He thought Blake was talking of interpretation. He said, when and where he told you. He said, a week before last, when I met him. Now, this becomes now a different area altogether. It is not historiography in any sense of the term. And it, uh, I would say it challenges the concept of history itself. So because Socrates to him is a living being, a part of the present, not somebody in distant past. And Tegos Megdut, even when he talks about it being separated by eons, nonetheless, nonetheless, he connects you to it in a way that it becomes relevant to you today as a part of it. That's what I want to convey. 
Um, so let me uh, respond to uh, Ashista and Ananya. I mean, uh, Ashista, since you brought up uh, the discipline of history, uh, uh, just let me spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, um, we might be going outside of the uh, sort of ostensible subject of the book, but but it it, it kind of relates to. Uh, why I wrote the book in this way? Why I write in a particular? Way, why I'm interested? Why I'm a musician? It it goes. It it has relationship to that. And then Ananya, you've asked me a couple of questions, which directly have to do with the book. One, one to do with my nieces, and the other to do with the Ragmala paintings uh, and their relationship to narrative of my nieces. Uh, and 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 uh, I want to uh, answer that as well. Let me first begin with trying to respond to Ashishta with, with few, uh, um, maybe dis diffused thoughts. Um, am I clearly audible? Uh, because sometimes Ashishta is not clearly audible, at least to me. So um, I hope the mic is working all right. It is. OK, but I've got, I've got what Ashishta yeah, I can hear you. OK. Um, so it, I think it is important to speak about the experience of the historical uh, in a way uh, that suggests that there are uh, various ways of experiencing the historical outside of this idea given to us through the discipline of history. That and and, and I'm not only talking about uh, you know ancient ways or or uh, new modern ways of understanding uh, the historical say through whatever means, including mythology. I'm talking about modern ways of understanding the historical, which uh, which uh, differs from the uh, the roots suggested by the discipline of history, and how important that these dissenting experiences of the historical are, and how fundamental they are to extending our understanding of what the historical might be, as Tagore does through his essay and his poems. Uh, on uh, on Kalidas or via Kalidas and a story like Kudit Pashan, the Hungry Stones, um, and and um, creates an aesthetic in argument with with historiography. It's important to see that you see, because in India, especially, we are deluged with a particular kind of understanding with the historical and and and. Uh, we kind of take it so much on board that we even see music and uh, writing and creative writing and, and fiction and poetry through that lens. So it, it, it's, no, uh, it's no surprise to, to, to kind of find that um, literature is seen as, as often as, as an embodiment of, of a national consciousness. While in fact, it might be in, in, in argument with the national consciousness. I mean, Tagore's argument with nationalism is, is not accidental to his also being the kind of poet he was. Uh, however, we, we, we stubbornly do continue, continue to see because we are deluged by a particular parameter of understanding experience, historical experience. We also see uh, literatures as national literatures. While they actually might be defining themselves against that. Uh, Tagore begins very early on uh, by trying to articulate his differences with uh, with the kind of mode of mastery and possession which uh, historiography, for instance, involves. So, in his notebook, which was only meant for his family in the 1880s, I think he 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 distinguishes between construction and creation. He makes a distinction over there between con what construction can do that creation can't and what creation can do that construction can't. And it's in this mood that he goes on to write Meghdut and Shopno. While he's pondering on these things, it's at the same time that he begins to write on them. Um, so th that th that's, a, that's something that I just wanted to uh, bring in over here, there's much more to say about that. Um, as far as uh, the points that Ananya uh, brought up, um, uh, absolutely, I mean, Western music has a narrative 
or a representational or a mimetic dimension, which is very important to it, uh, whether or not those musicians or composers set out to be representational or mimetic or narrative in their intentions, they are now, they have been for a long time, it seems to me, I'm not an authority, but it seems to me in a kind of tradition which uh, overlays the music, fun, very in a very, not overlays, makes it very fundamentally representational in character. Um, sometimes, of course, the composer wants to do it. So the composer might tie up a, a symphony or a, or a composition to a program as uh, uh, Beethoven did with the sixth symphony, the pastoral. In, in the pastoral symphony, uh, which is the one that I was listening to when I was 16, um, the, the it was very clear as to what the sections were that represented, let us say, springtime, happy feelings, uh, the arrival in the countryside, the arrival of the country folk, and uh, what the sections were that represented the storm or stormy weather, darkness. So there would be a, a, a change uh, in not only in mood and in pacing, but in, uh, in, in the notes. One of the basic changes that takes place, it seems to me, is that the major scale is identified with happiness. And the minor scales or, or flats and sharps are identified with, with the more introspective moods. Uh, chromatic notes are identified uh, with, uh, with often with stress and terror. So for instance, now, now these are chromatic notes. This is ni, sa, komal, re. They're, they're all uh, half, uh, they're semitone away from each other. In Rag Shri, they have no sense of, they don't invoke any sense of terror, nor do they invoke a sense of terror in uh, Purvi or Puriyadhana Shri. In Rag Shri, you can sing these notes in this particular way. But if these the notes were to be played in Western music, they would immediately be used in a scene to do with the terrifying development in, in a movie. You would not use these notes in that movie if two lovers are coming together in happiness and are being reunited with, with each other. Sep certainly would not be using these chromatic notes. So as anybody who has worked in these two traditions, Western and Indian, would be aware that something else is happening in Indian music. Uh, outside of the representational. This is not to say that the music is totally abstract and is world denying. It is the opposite. It is world embracing. It is world embracing. But in what way does it embrace the world if it does not do so by representation? That is, I, I embrace the world by saying it was a beautiful day outside. Uh, the birds were, you know, in the branches. If this is not the way I embrace the world, then in through the raga, in what way do I embrace the world? So the, the, the embrace of the world comes through these kind of situate through situatedness, the situatedness that language itself has in the world, where you you sing Kedar in the evening. Uh, you use the word evening to refer to evening. The word evening has a great deal of beauty in it, we've, which we've forg forgotten. The beauty is contingent and cultural and social. That is, there was, not, there was no God that said to us that only the word evening must be used to describe or refer to evening. It happened over time. This happening over time we call culture and language. And yet, Language has an untapped beauty, which is always there for us to tap into. It is a referential beauty, but it is not necessarily a representational or narrative beauty. Similarly, over time, Bhairav is associated for us, as the word morning is, with, with, with a certain time in the morning. It cannot be used in the evening 
to bring to life or to, to homage to evening any more than morning can be used to refer to evening, the word morning. So we are speaking of partaking of an entire language here when we listen to rags. We are entering a language. We are not just using language to describe. We are entering a language. That means we are not only entering a rag, we are entering other features of the language which include the light outside. That too is a feature of this language. The light in the morning and the light in the evening. These are features of this language which we enter. The rag is another feature of the language that we enter. Um, when you uh, talk about the, the Ragmala paintings, uh, Ananya, um, I, I would, I've th often thought about these Ragmala paintings and the figure in, in, uh, in Indian art. I think, you know, the figure in Indian art, the figure in, in a non-humanist artistic tradition doesn't have any of that humanistic weight that the figure does in a humanistic tradition. By the humanistic tradition, I mean post-enlightenment, the Renaissance, neoclassicism. In, in neoclassicism, in the Renaissance, it's the journey of the human that becomes the central journey. So anything that you then draw a, a, a figure of, let us say it's, let us say you, you draw a figure and you say, this figure is called sorrow. So personification, right? Uh, in personification, you are using the figure to personify, let us say, abstract states or emotions. But at the center of that universe in which personification is taking place is the human being. The enlightenment has occurred. We are in a human-centered universe. At the center of the universe is the human being. But with, with the Indian tradition, the human being is not at the center. There is an equal weight between the universe, the leaf, the branch, the light, and the human being. So if the Ragamala, if Kedar or Bhairav, let's say one is a Rag, one is a Ragini, and, and, and they are represented as, one is represented as a yogi, another is represented as a woman. Uh, and yet it is not representation. Yet it is not an act of personification because at the center of the universe is not the human being. The, the, the form that we are seeing the Rag in is just a, it's just a, way of suggesting our encounters with the various forms that exist in the universe. The human figure is a convenient way to, to express that encounter. Um, so so uh, um, when, when modern art in, in the West moves away from neoclassicism and the Renaissance, Immediately it begins to destroy the human figure and then move towards the non-figurative, right? It, that's what begins to happen with post-impressionism, abstract art. In, in, in uh, modern Indian art, the figure is stylized, but there, nobody feels any anxiety to move away from the figure. Jamini Roy does not move away from the figure. Uh, Amrita Shergil does not move away from the figure. KG Subramaniam does not move away from the figure. And yet their figures, the figure in those, their paintings is not the same as the figures in Raja Ravi Verma, which do come out of a neoclassical tradition or humanist tradition. They, they, there is a great sense of liberation in these figures because they're non-humanistic. They're not meant to emblematize some kind of centrality of the human in the universe. So there is no anxiety that in, in modern Indian art, that we have to move away from the figure because of this oppressiveness of, uh, of the Renaissance tradition. Yes, there is an oppressiveness in that tradition that was taught to these artists, all the artists I mentioned, in their art school. They call it academic training, academic painting. By that, they mean the neoclassical and the Renaissance uh, uh, legacy. 
They move away from that, but they don't move away from the figure. This is because the figure is not freighted with that humanist deadness in, in, in Indian art. I would say that's why the, the, the Ragmala paintings, the rags in them seem so fluid and alive and don't have any of the kind of ponderousness for me. These, these are very idiosyncratic views, I'm aware, uh, that figures do in Renaissance paintings. Okay. Um, you know, we have a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, just before we go to them, I do want to say that I think it's it's very interesting um, how you write about Tagore in the context of music, in the context of literature, in the context of history, in the context of Bengal, in the context of modernity, in so many different writings of yours, including in this book. Um, because you're not you, you're not a practitioner of Rabindra Shangit, right? No, I do, sing, I do sing Rabindra Shangit, but not. I haven't. I have sung Rabindra Shangit in public a couple of times, but but uh, no. But you're right. Yeah. I'm not a that's, professional. You know, that's, yeah, that's not your primary form as a musician or as a singer. Um, and also, interestingly, I think what probably draws you again and again to Tagore is. Uh, precisely a kind of sensibility that you know you yourself as an artist share with him which is polymathic and synesthetic so you know you're constantly thinking at the same time in musical terms and literary terms in terms of painting and art mm -hmm. and other kinds of forms mm -hmm. and you know who better to to exemplify and illustrate those kinds of ways of thinking I think than Tagore and and you do that with great effect Although I must mention for our viewers who haven't seen the book yet, that you know you also, in a very nice serendipitous way, a very kind of sabhavik and uh, sahaj, you know, you uh, suddenly you your your prose arrives on uh, Bharat and the Natya Shastra. Then you know you turn a corner and we are we are looking at Amir Khusro, uh, and then you know we take two steps back, huh? And Tansen, yeah, and Tansen appears, you know, and then suddenly it's Satyajit Rai and Mani Kaul, and it's you know, so all kinds of points of musical sparking, which are part of the whole cultural continuum of of this this form that you talk about, and the the history of the raga in a sense, that is uh, you know beautifully kind of um, uh, rendered. I would say in your in your uh, in your work. Now I have several questions, uh, so I you know, and we must give time to them, uh, even if we go a little bit over our allotted time. You'll still need the time, so let me uh, just quickly run through them for you. Some of them, at least. Um, there's a couple of questions from uh, Monali in Chennai, who I actually know. Um, first, she asks. Um, how would you replace the basis of bliss from Akar uh, for an instrumentalist? This is her first question. And her second question is, now with concerts happening in closed auditoria in unnatural light, you know, how relevant is this idea of rag samay chakra or uh, ritu ragas, seasonal ragas in today's concert scenario? Um, this is her question. And I should say that Monali is familiar with um, you know, both Carnatic and uh, Hindustani music and with Rabindra Shangit. She sings in many languages. Um, so that's her question and uh, two questions. And actually, I'll just um, um, I'll just put on the table maybe one other question because it's uh, it's uh, it's related, I think. Um, It's from Shashwat Bhattacharya, and this person is in New Delhi. And, and uh, Shashwat says, would you like to discuss a bit about the strategic incompleteness of representation um, of life writing and of classical music? That is to say, in your work, you know, you keep talking about repeated fresh starts in your life. And there is a parallel to that structure of alap and khayal. And also, is this a mark of a repeated attempt and subsequent failure to empty oneself in music and words? 
So why don't you take those questions, Amit, and then we'll move on to others. Okay. Uh, so uh, the first two questions, uh, it's a simple question, but a nice one uh, to do with, uh, you know, how, uh, what does an instrumentalist do about, about tone, about tonality, uh, which would, which would uh, approximate uh, um, Akar, um, One, one of the things that uh, um, distinguishes at least um, at least the sitar, but also s other kinds of Indian instruments, uh, including the basis of singing or performing th the instrument, which is at the basis that is often rather unimaginatively imaginatively called the drone the tanpura is is the is, is the jowari uh, that is the in the tanpura the, the 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 strings you put at the bottom which um which make uh, uh, the threads the the threads you put at the bottom of the strings at the bridge of the tanpura which makes the strings buzz with an impurity and a resonance this is called juari and uh, um, that juari in a tanpura leads to a kind of overlapping of the two notes that tanpura plays only two notes on the four strings the the, the middle two notes uh, sorry middle two strings play uh, the tonic the the outer string plays either the fifth or the seventh that is pa or ni or it could play the madhyam if there is no pa or ni in the rag uh, that is the fourth and the note on the on the right hand side extreme right uh, the string on the extreme right plays the lower uh, tonic the lower sa uh, as you play the notes because of the buzz of impurity as you play the strings they begin to merge into each other you cannot clearly hear after a point uh, sa 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 pa gradually it, the, the sounds begin to merge I, so i i think um besides shruti in in notes besides gamak besides the various kinds of undulations this this jowari in the in the strings of the sitar of the tanpura um, creates a kind of la um, a lack of uh, of definition which which uh, which uh, converges into a sort of purity and richness. So purity is, in this case, is not a, it's not de uh, uh, something that's well defined. It is something that is being released through a gradual lack of definition in sound. So in 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 say in a Western uh, context, say the guitar, uh, the guitar strings have a clean sound. The acoustic guitar has a clean sound. It's only much later that the rock musicians uh, um, brought in a sense of impurity. Uh, to And blues musicians especially brought in a kind of impurity to the uh, strings of the guitar, uh, which was often called the distortion or fuzz. And it allowed them to play... Uh, in a in a style closer to singing, the the the, the bent notes that they were playing. Uh, if you're looking at people like say BB King, um, it, they, they have introduced a degree of impurity uh, uh, to the to 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 the sound of the guitar, a kind of fuzz fuzziness, which enriches. The, the the sound takes it out of what is called the clean sound 
which is well defined into something which is more suggestive so i think that is, me is means like that should possibly bring the 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 notes in in western i'm sorry in indian instrumental music closer to singing and and closer to maybe akar as well um what was the other thing that that, that yeah, she asked? I, i'm so sorry to interrupt you but i'm i'm just letting you know we are technically we've completed an hour we can yeah. go a little bit over but you know that might mean that you have to uh, yeah. you know be a little more succinct the second so, question mali asked was huh. the fact that we are always singing now in closed spaces not in natural settings and that the light is unnatural so there's no sense of day or night or morning or evening or anything what does that do to what kind of violence does that do to 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 the very grammar of uh, of of hindustani music where time of day season etc is so important yeah i'll try to be succinct it's not always easy when one is uh, sort of i know uh, i know i mean to, uh, I, you know, i would love to you know for you to carry uh, on uh, rather than I, giving two fabricated answers but uh, um so so it in, in which is also easy to do um but um with with the concert space i think um it it has many limitations today which which uh, it would be nice to sort of recognize and come out of um it would be wonderful to see ashishta and you ananya is if that's possible otherwise i feel like i'm talking to myself okay so uh, um uh, it's not just the, the 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 severance of the concert space from uh Uh, you know uh, one's environment uh, uh, time of day season of course that that that's there as well uh, the the shunning of not only environment and seasons but of various forms of random activity uh, and sounds uh, which uh, which the rag which places the rag within the unfolding of time and doesn't put time on hold as it were Uh, while while we sit in in a in a concert space uh, um, which is what happens with western music it's as if the day has been put on hold it the same thing happens when we go to a movie for instance you know the day has been put on hold so if somebody is talking or was still looking at their cell phone but or if their children uh, wondering about uh, the unfolding of the day is rudely introduced into what is a pristine space where time has been put on hold but the rag is not supposed to be always in such an environment you know i'm not talking about i'm not saying that the the rudeness of in, inattentive uh, listeners should be encouraged but i'm saying that there is a certain kind of randomness uh, that's the, that that's there in open uh, uh, concert halls and open concert spaces uh, which which the rag has a natural home in you know and and so bringing that back would also help in loosening up this structure where indian classical music north indian classical music itself has become such an artificial domain uh where not only has one been severed from whatever is outside the concert space but that the concert space has become not only a space for music but a theater of gesture where uh, you know the 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 main performer is supposed to be dressed in a certain way uh they 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 kind of connect themselves to the music and to through tradition through certain gestures uh, there there's frequent touching of the feet there's frequent ear pulling uh, a, a, and things like that one would want those uh, that that entire theater to to now be disrupted and 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 things to be opened up uh, indian classical music over the last 30 years ha has especially last two decades maybe has suffered from being in this enclosure and the enclosure has now been been marked more and more by these symbolic gestures the symbolic gestures could also uh, uh, become a feature of the music that is we know 
that uh, after the tabla comes in with the sitar, gradually the, the speed will accelerate and then we will sort of uh, uh, move to a very fast kind of uh, tempo and then uh, there will be maybe there, there might be sawal jawab uh, and then there, 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 there will be a chakradar uh, kind of tihai and then it will end. Um, these are all parts of uh, a, a kind of form of music that has been too enclosed and too ready to identify itself through, to, through certain markers. And those markers, whether, I mean, even if some of those markers are let, uh, put aside, like Sawal Jawab, or ending the, uh, um, the sitar kind of recital on a crescendo and a very, at a very high tempo, even if th those are set aside, we open up something. Oh, there was a question about incompleteness. Uh, yeah. So, so um, I don't have time for that. Maybe if there's any other question, you can give it to me. No. Uh, so I just I just want to tell you some things that people are saying here. There's hmm. Anjali Kapila, uh, who says that she found it really beautiful that you replaced the self with a note or a swar. Okay. And then she says, why do you use the word finding? Uh, you know, in, in in your title, you know, in this work, it is actually like a coming upon, not like the result of a finding. And if you could elaborate. And then Sharon Lowen says, uh, the dancer, she says, uh, thanks for a discussion with depth. And I, and I knew it would be that. And I'm connecting all the dots. And then uh, Mohini Malik says, should we not take the term khayal more seriously in the present discussion? Um, this is what I can see so far. And, uh, you know, uh, and then Shashwat Bhattacharya earlier had asked about, you know, the parallels between your life and the structure of the alap, you know, starting again, starting again, going back to the beginning, uh, in a sense, uh, the, that iterative attempt, which is never quite uh, successful, but yet, you know, you have to go back to it. As you say, you sing Tori every morning. No matter what, right? You begin your day with, you know, you you do this, you know, that hour of riyaz every single day, you know, and you're never bored of it. And no two no two days are the same, right? But you've still not totally got the rag in some sort of sense of perfection or completion. So that idea of incompleteness, I think this this particular person wants you to uh, just say more about, you know. Okay, so there was incompleteness. There was a, uh, the word khayal. There was a there was another finding, finding, finding. versus finding. coming upon. Okay, so maybe we can end on on I these. We'll have to step, yeah, we'll have to stop then. Uh, yeah. um, so these two points. Uh, so the incompleteness. You know, uh, uh, one can uh, uh, speak about incompleteness for hours and hours. I think I'm going to end up writing more about incompleteness than I have written fiction or any other you know I, you put all my fictions together which are incomplete and, and brief and then you re write read all the stuff i've written about incompleteness and in the end i think those writings on incompleteness are going to be more uh, in in size and bulk or whatever than my actual writings i i've now come to that conclusion that this is going to happen definitely um so uh i so i won't spend too much time on it uh, the question of beginnings. I love beginnings. I love beginnings uh, as a as a fiction writer. Uh, um, to me, uh, the, the 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 novel is at its most unresolved uh, in the first paragraphs or in the first two pages. It, uh, it the the we are we are introduced to a world. We're introduced to a world without explanation and we come into a kind of primary contact with it. The, the novelist's imagination also has come into primary contact with that world in, in those first paragraphs and pages. After that, he or she must begin explaining what this character is doing, or what's happening in that room, what is happening in that street, and then what is about to happen. And then something very much like a syntax or a grammar begins to come into place. The, the, the first 
two pages have still not entered that grammar. There is language, but it's almost as if it's unshackled of grammar, as poetry is. Poetry is not shackled by, it has, it has certain kind of very subtle observances, but it is unshackled by narrative grammar. It gives you something, you come into contact with it, you know. It does not then tell you why you've come into contact with it and what is going to happen later. Well, the moment that happens, we, we enter into this particular syntax. And syntax implies completing it. You know, completing the picture, telling us, putting all the kind of parameters in place. I love the potential that the first pages have of not being concerned about putting everything in place. This great sense of potential is one that I would like to somehow encompass the entire novel. And I think uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the ambition among novelists to do this uh, happens with modernism and, and it happens with people like Virginia Woolf or Joyce uh, writing about novels about a single day. They write a novel about a single day because they want to stay with the beginning. They do not want to go to day two, day three, day four, and then the life, which is what the 19th century novel does. Bless the 19th century novel for its huge accomplishments. But uh, a, a kind of other route is taken and day two is never arrived at in Mrs. Dalloway. These are writers who want to stay with that primary contact with what has been introduced and forget about the syntax of narrative, which says, but then what happened? Uh, well, what are these people going to do tomorrow and day after? And why did you introduce us to them? The, the introduction, the introduction is so um, lifelike and, uh, 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 and true that one only wants to stay with the introduction. It came to me when I was writing the book, how strange that the, the main contribution of khayal, the main uh, component of khayal should be called alap. This is what khayal does, which no other form does. Spend 30 minutes or more yeah. elaborating on something which in a song can be sung in one minute. Thai mm. antra you can sing in one minute. The alap shows us that it is possible to stay with the introduction mm. uh, over, over time. Mm. Uh, uh, so as I was writing this, it, it, it came to me that this is, this is uh, an extraordinary feature and desire for a form to have. Okay, so enough with the incompleteness bit. Um, and uh, getting instructions from our tech people that we need to um, we need to close very soon. Yeah, is there um, going to be an implosion or uh, no, that, that's not going to happen. But is there going to be a what? An implosion of some kind. <laughs> no, we're still we at the end. beginning. It's fine. We must, we must end soon. Uh, um, what was the, let me try and quickly succinctly touch upon the other two. What, uh, what were the other two questions? Why, you, why have you titled finding. the book Finding the Raga when actually yeah. you've come upon it? Khayal, I don't need to talk about because I've hinted at Khayal, the importance of Khayal in the, the previous book. answer. I've, I've, and it's there in the book and I've hinted at yeah. it. it. Uh, finding... Uh, the book is about a turn. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I was, a, as I say in the, in the book, I was a Canadian singer-songwriter in the making. <laughs> I never expected to become a Hindustani classical singer. I never expected to become a novelist. I thought I'd be a poet. I mean, the life is full of pitiful turns, you know. Um, I, I there are so many things um, that that one ends up doing, uh, which one doesn't do because you know you've been told that you should do them or that they're good or you know uh, they're part of something you've inherited. None of this was part of what I inherited in in a, in a direct sense. I had to find uh, these things. Uh, thankfully, I was in a very hospitable environment, which 
allowed me to find these things. I think that kind of hospitality is far more uh, important than you having parents and being in an environment where you're told that you know this is what is important and therefore you're taken weekly to a museum or given talim in a certain kind of music or whatever or told to learn the piano more than that is is this hospitable environment where you're allowed to make these kind of where you're allowed to find as it were and i i thankfully i lived in that kind of environment that the my parents created for me so i found even, the rag even, even on doordarshan as you as you mentioned uh, when you're just randomly watching music shows on television as a teenager you know you you, you find so many things that really yeah i discovered natya natya sangeet natya sangeet balan sarva kishori amonkar and bhimsen joshi uh, yeah. and through pratibhani pratima which my parents didn't watch uh, <laughs> and, and and channel 2 on uh, bombay television where balgandhar was uh, records were being played yeah right right well you know um I, i think i think we have to close but uh uh i sh i should say what you were saying earlier about the over conventionalization uh the constriction the constraining the enclosure you know which which uh which harms perhaps uh the flow of of hindustani music and all other kinds of indian classical music i would say i think uh one thing we learn from ashish das entire oeuvre right is okay, that yeah. is that all all aspects of our cultural and our cultural life and our civilizational project in 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 his terms uh have suffered from this kind of constraint and uh you know abandoning the possibilities of 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 being open ended right of finding the raga of finding you know your alap of you know starting again doing the same thing over keeping on doing it till you know at, as long as it gives you bliss you know all that kind of um way of living and thinking and being um has has been greatly harmed i think uh in the present uh, on account of so many uh, vicissitudes and pathologies that that uh, you know uh modernity has in, introduced into our our lives um and this is something which ashish da has has taught us better than anything else so i i i thank you both um you know your 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 uh you know contributions to enriching um you know our lives even in these very difficult times are are absolutely exemplary and and welcome um and you've you've provided us once more uh, amit with something to 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 immerse ourselves in and 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 live with uh and and learn from uh and i would recommend to all uh this this wonderful new book um and um, you know spend as much time as you can um with this very interesting mind um <laughs> uh in the form of uh, of 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 amit choudhury so thank you ashish da thank you amit and uh, thank you to the international center thank thank you thanks to everybody and thank you anand thank you ashish da i your your uh, an anecdote you told me once about somebody calling you a deprofessionalized intellectual been, that word deprofessionalized uh, has been important to me so thank you thank you know